Welcome back to Access Grandin, everyone. I'm Mike Ionelli, your host. Today, we're continuing our exploration of accessibility in e-commerce and the global impact of prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion with our friends from Commerce Tools. Get ready to hear more from Stephanie Forbes, Nicole Hayworth, and Mark Stracuza as they share their invaluable insights into Commerce Tools' dedication and commitment to accessibility on a company-wide scale. I think you hit the nail on the head earlier. Get to know people that are different from you. We just recently did an unconscious bias training where we did an exercise called called our the trusted 10. And you just write down your top 10 people that you work with or you you trust that you trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the sheet is blank. And then once we open up the sheet, they have these all these categories. And then you start rating each person. I know you don't supposed to do that. But the point is, is that to show you how diverse or not diverse Mm -hmm. or how not inclusive you are. And it gives you the opportunity to say, okay, I need to talk to more people that are different from me. Talk to more people that have a disability. Talk to more people that are for different culture or whatever. Um, So I think that's important that we all should do on our own not because of a job or anything but to get Mm -hmm. to know different people so we can have those unique people around the table to end world hunger to go to the moon whatever it is that we need them to do so i think one of the cool things at commerce tools that i've been fortunate to be a part of now for multiple years is we have this uh every four weeks we have this group that gets together and and we it's an open we call it open conversations and essentially we pick a topic that is diversity adjacent and and i say that word because sometimes it is directly uh you know gender bias or cultural bias or things like that or sometimes it's just it's just related but the idea is uh we all get together and on company time by the way which is one of the coolest things ever is they let us they pay us to do this uh which essentially is we sit together and we just talk for an hour about we all bring our own perspectives and in open com- open That's forum awesome. and we just talk about this topic <clears throat> and, and and it's a very flowing conversation we we all tend yeah. to ramble a little bit because yeah. none of us have really you know co- you know come to it with a, a pre-described thought process we're just kind of letting it go where but it no goes. judgment no yeah. judgment yeah. and you'll say something and somebody else will say something and that will spark something in my brain and we're all sharing a little piece of ourselves and we talk about empathy b- proximity builds empathy and i love that way that it was said because i've had a similar thought in my head but never that's concise which is that you know in order to really change and to really like to really try and uh, affect somebody positively you have to be empathetic towards that group Mm -hmm. and the only way to do that is through close conversation Mm -hmm. i think hate spreads very quickly and very rapidly widely um but empathy and love or something that that it really is a personal relationship a personal connection and it takes smaller engagements to do that Mm -hmm. um and i think that anytime you have an opportunity to do that and i love that these little conversations we have every four weeks help foster that, a, a sense of community within the company, a mm. sense of understanding within the company. Um, it's really my, one of my favorite part about my jobs. I'm interested because, you know, I did a, a post the other day and it sparked a conversation about ROI, which, um, and and people say, well, 20% of the work, you know, if, if, if a company is diverse, it's 20% more, pro- people throwing numbers out. Right. And I'm sure there's but there's not a, a ton of amazing data, but there is data that proves it. Lots of Gartner groups done some data. But I'm, uh, what are you all seeing? Because one, I, I can tell from the outside looking in that you're this group, you've got three diverse people in this group and you guys work like you've been working. I mean, it's really remarkable. And in terms of like a case study, I'd say this just being in this room, the three of you is enough to prove the case study. But have you guys have seen, like obviously other than the feeling, but this four week thing you guys are doing and talking and, and a judgment for, it's gotta help in every capacity of what you guys do. Truthfully, are you seeing things that are impacting the business and impacting your relationships with each other and impacting ultimately the end user and the customer? Are you guys seeing some of that? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes. I, we talk about quantifiable, and I think that's hard to describe because you can never, you don't have two parallel tracks that you can view in isolation and say, mm-hmm. if we had done this and not done this, what would the difference be? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one of my favorite expressions is you don't, you only get one path through life, right? You don't get to see it if you did something different. But I, I will say this um, I think what we do foster and what I have definitely seen tangibly is the sense of people feel enabled to speak to be themselves and to speak their own thoughts out loud. And I've seen that tangibly, uh, both as when I was in my my, my first role as a product manager, where I'm working directly with development uh, individuals, uh, your group of diverse people. And when people are comfortable speaking their minds, they feel safe, they feel Mm -hmm. uh, able to speak out loud, then you're getting their thoughts. They feel like they belong. They feel like they Mm -hmm. are a sense of belonging, exactly. Um, Then you're seeing tangible output 
both in their direct their direct output from a from a functional perspective, from a delivery perspective. Mm -hmm. But of course, the thoughts when you when one person speaks their mind, it sparks somebody else's brain, and then you start to have more innovative thought because you're starting to get more inclusive thought. You're getting more innovative thought. I have see, I've seen that directly tangible in the output of different functionalities, and, and that we're approaching delivery of certain uh, features within our own roadmap. So. How that has affected the bottom line, it's hard to know because I don't know what it would have been different. Mm -hmm. But I can definitely say that it, there's been improvement. There's been visible, visible improvement from the people that I've worked with, from the people, uh, the community within the company and fostering that type of inclusivity. Yeah, I would say culture, but you guys don't look at that. I was going to say, it must, <laughs> it must make the culture. Uh, we talked about top down. And that's such a big thing. I mean, it really, really is. And I do think some leaders frankly need to go truthfully at larger organizations that are not thinking this way. But how was the leadership there at Commerce Tools? How do they embrace this? Because it's this sounds amazing. Like it, I'm being serious, this is you guys are amazing. This sounds so good. And I hope when you go back to the office, you guys are like, let's go. But how was it embraced? A DEI didn't start as just DEI. I started actually after the George Floyd murder. Uh, we had a group called Engage the Change, and we had a leader that was very supportive about helping the employees to uh, affect change, to go out and make a difference, to be inclusive, to to help others and, and do everything. Of course, you know, in the time frame that we can, we can't solve everything. We would love to help and do everything for everybody. But a group of people got together, a group of employees got together and called Engage and Change and developed this group to go out and put their money where, where it counts in, in different organizations, put action to volunteer at different places. I think Mark was probably one of the original yeah. people that started the Engage to Change. And then with Engage to Change, that's when DEI uh, started. But you want to tell a little bit more about I'll Engage? I'll tell a little bit of story. Yeah. So right after the murder of George Floyd, the president of the Americas at Commerce Tools at the point, that point in time called it uh, a U.S. all hands. Uh, I had just started at Commerce Tools. I think I'd been there a couple months, and basically, he just he just kind of spoke for a few minutes, his own thoughts, uh, he, how he hurt he was, that we were all kind of uh, a hurt. little bit lost, yeah. right? We were all a little bit confused, and he said, "I I don't know what to do, but we're going to try something." And what he basically challenged us is, he's like, "I want you all to just." Bring forth what ideas you have, and we weren't trying to ch to change the world. He said, "We're not, you know, we're not going to change the world, but we'll, if we can make commerce tools more reflective of the community around us, wow. then that would be a great first step." Um, and and he and again, he backed it up with this. It wasn't just words. He backed it up with both in hours time. I wasn't having to do this off after hours, and with money. Literally, like we said, "Hey, I have an idea. I want to do this." I think we came up with a list of like twenty ideas. Mm -hmm. And some of them were good, some of them were bad. All of them that needed to be were funded. Um, and and it went on that way for a while. And then again, Stephanie was part of that original movement. And then Stephanie was was brought into this formalized position because uh, because at that point in time, we didn't have a, a, a yeah. someone like yeah. Stephanie yeah, who I was watching over DNI. I think that's key to learn about Stephanie's career path because I think that's, that's really exemplary that. of... In my last life. No. <laughs> You only get I, one. <laughs> well, I got two. So <laughs> I've always done uh, administrative roles, whether executive administrative, administrative assistant. I've always been in the boardrooms with all of the executives, hearing all of the conversations and and figuring out what can I do to help out. Anyway, so I was able to uh, come and join Commerce Tools through actually Nicole had reached out to me and, and told me about an open role. And I started as an executive assistant. One um, of the most underrated jobs on the planet oh by the way gosh. oh my gosh yeah, tell right. me about that it is, yeah. uh, anyway <laughs> yeah, just that's a such a difficult job right and so the president of of the americas at that time he was like hey i want to do something with dei can you help me do some research sure I only have only 10,000 other things to do. I'm sure I can jump on that. Whatever it takes. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, I, you know, I went and, and did some uh, research and, and talked to an, another organization that, that gave me some training and, and studies and data and all that stuff. And I helped him uh, work on a strategy. But I couldn't have done that role without starting with a gauge to change, who actually was the catapult that put me into this role that created this role for me um, to do this DEI role from what they originally started. And I just took that and just 
massaged it a little bit and was able to present that to our uh, C-suite executives and they were on board and they put money towards it. So that's how DEI came to be at Commerce Tools. And it is very important to have leadership a tie to it or backing it and pushing it because we can't do what we need to do without their support. And then most companies, if the leadership is not, you know, subordinate, the employees are not going to support Amen, it. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's where it, it kind of went. And I think the through line of what you both said too is, I think the key is money. Like you can say, I yeah. really want diversity. I really want everyone to feel inclusive. But like, if you're not willing to put money out there to help support this, then mm-hmm. it's yeah. not going to go anywhere. <clears throat> that's right. If yeah. you're not willing to invest your resources into what's important to you, then it must not be that important to you. Yeah, and it, it, and that's one of the challenges with accessibility. You know, when you sort of to to, to drum into that, it's like, well, and, and everything in that matter, it's like, well, we haven't done this before, so what do we do now? And knowing that it takes effort, it takes time, and it takes commitment. You yeah. know, because you can, to your point, you can say it all day long, but mm-hmm. and I, and I work in this every day. I mean, I talk to people every day, and and the conversations you hear, are, you know, that we don't we don't have buy in. This isn't a priority. Uh, we've got some other things to do, and I keep and, and I'm on the line. In the very beginning, when we started the company, I was a little bit more, a uh, little bit crazier. I would say things. Well, that's kind of odd. You don't have time or money to include people, you know. <laughs> and really? I was, but now I'm not so much like that anymore. But I I'm on the edge of saying that still because it's still, you know, one thing that's cool about not not to talk about Abler too much, but what what we do as a company, which I think is great, other than being a nonprofit and mission driven, is that. You don't have to have all the money. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the resources. We can start really small. Yeah. And we can work towards something amazing. And that may take a year or two or three. But it's when an organization that recognizes, we have some today that I just uh, I just love. That's why I'm doing this podcast because of our clients, truthfully. It's like we don't have anything, but we want to do something. What can we do? And we start with just a webinar. And all of a sudden, two or three people hear it, and it turns into, wow, I didn't realize this. And it, it, it takes people like you and, and your, frankly, your leaders of support, which I am blown away by that. I really am. That's amazing. So shout out to them. It takes difficult conversations. It takes people saying things that, that are uncomfortable. It takes courage, a lot of courage to do mm-hmm. what we do yeah. around this table. It takes action. You know, you have to do something. And I think it, it, taking one single step is something as simple as a webinar or something as simple as going on YouTube or something as simple as what does an experience look like for somebody that's not like me? And that's that's incredibly rewarding to see. I think when you talk about accessibility, I'm, I'm interested because now that you're working towards that as an organization, inclusion, accessibility, yeah. how does that impact the rest of the organization? I'm just really interested because everything from the outside is amazing. I mean, I'm I'm really <laughs> sincerely blown away. I mean, I can't believe this conversation we're having because a lot of times it's always the top down isn't on board. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and for, to hear that an organization like you and and the connections and relationships you have with so many people are leading a top down, that has to be touching. I mean, we always talk about how one person, you touch one person and that person touches three more and those three touch nine more. And all of a sudden you're talking about spreading the love, the joy, the compassion, the kindness, all that is spreading out because of that one action. Yeah. I could say first it came with education again and bringing awareness, but we have really opened up the opportunity for our managers to be able to talk to their employees one-on-one, having those um, psychologically safe Mm -hmm. discussions on what your employee needs. Uh, We have the opportunity for the employees to come to HR or to their direct manager or their team lead to open up those conversations and provide, you know, say, Hey, I need this in order to do X, Y, and Z in order to do my job. Um, We have really taught the managers and I think uh, talent has really done is has empowered the managers even more with them pushing back on certain things. Well, why do you need this? Why can't, you know, why can't this person do this and that Uh, really challenging their thoughts and I think with all the training that we're doing and bringing the awareness is giving the managers more authority to be able to say, hey, what do you need in order to make your life easier? What do you need in order for you to complete your job? What is it that we can do? So it's very open. Have you had conflict? Have you had people say, well, wait a minute, no, no, I disagree, or I'm not going to do that, or I don't. 
what have you had any issues along the way? Um, I'm sure there have been issues that haven't been brought up to me though. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> but we yeah. do have we do have business partners where each employee can go and talk to a business partner about particular needs if they run into a particular challenge with their manager, um, and then they bring that business partner in and have that discussion. So that's that's one way that people are are being able to address those challenges. And it's also again, and I hate to keep repeating myself, it's about constantly staying before the people and making sure that they are aware of what people need, you know, that there are needs. the repetitive nature. Yes, of you have to stay yeah. on top of people. You have to stay before them all the time. So they and won't that's a forget. Commitment. Exactly. That's hard for all it of us is. to exactly. stay consistent. So what I think you're saying is, hey, if you're going to have an accessibility program, it has to be a commitment. It has to be from the top down. Yeah. It has to be financially supported. Yeah. And it has to be not just, hey, we're going to give this a shot for a couple of months. This is a commitment to our yeah. DNA. Exactly. This is who and, we are as an organization moving forward today. And I think it takes understanding that it's it's not an instant fix. Right. It's a it's a process. It's yeah. a journey. You know, self improvement's a journey. Cultural improvement is a journey. We say culture, Nicole. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's fine. It's cultural improvement. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's not a it's not something that today is fixed, you know, because we did one thing. It's something that you're constantly evaluating and identifying and, yeah. and trying to improve. And sometimes you're going to succeed and sometimes you're going to fail. And I think it takes understanding and, and perseverance in that regard to say, we're going to keep trying to move the needle forward. We're going to keep trying to make this better for as many people as possible from an internal company perspective, from an external product perspective. But um, having that space to fail, see, that's... Space I, to fail is that important. That is so yeah. important. Oh, yeah. And, and I think, you know, Again, I'll bring it back just to a real quick personal story. Um, you know, again, when I was leading a team from a product perspective, and I took one of the inclusivity and implicit bias trainings that was given here at Commerce Tools, I immediately was like, I realized that I had been doing something over and over again in every call that I've ever done in my entire life uh, that was non inclusive. And the next call I went on, I got on the call and I said, and, I, and my team was diverse. And I went and I said, I want to apologize to all you all. I realized I've been saying, hey, guys, mm -hmm. on every call I've ever done. God, I've been saying that the whole Every time. Every person. <laughs> and then I, and I stopped for a second and I said, I'd like to try and correct that, but I'm probably going to fail. Yeah. And I was like, I want to say, hey, I, like here in the South, we could say y'all. Y'all. Yeah, Super inclusive. Yeah. I remember going on the, that call and I remember the look, I remember it very vividly, of, of, the, uh, of the team, but especially the female members of my team, who were just like, wow. Like I could see like that just that little change yeah. made such an impact to their sense of belonging. Yeah. And it's such a small thing, right? Wow. But it's also, Never I failed. I failed so many times. I, every time, I, I mean, I even like the other day I got on a call and I, I remember because Stephanie, you were on the call yeah. and I said, I said, hey guys, I, thanks for the call. And I went, I called myself, I was like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I can't believe I just said that. I was like, sorry, everybody. Right. Can we make guys inclusive for everyone? In, the, in, the, in Latin culture. The Midwest, it's, Is it hard for you too? Yes. Yes. But I, I'm a hey y'all person now. But I think it's just, hey y'all. Hey you know, it's, yeah, it's hey these little things that maybe to most people, some people don't matter, but it to matters. the people it matters to, it matters greatly. Well, that's yeah. it. So if I, I think I'm saying, hey guys, like when you walked in. It does doesn't it, bother yeah. me personally, but. It, so, but do you yeah. think about it? Does it actually, no. is, it, is it unconscious? Like, is it, is it a thought? It is. It's okay. an unconscious thing that you do. Yeah. Cause it's something that you've heard all your life, right? Is something that's always been said. Hey guys, hey guys, hey guys, hey guys. What's up, guys? You know, yeah. Now, if you walked into a room full of females, you might say, "Hey, guy." You wouldn't say, "Hey, gals." No, I wouldn't say, "Hey, gals." No, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not that. Nice. Hey, hey y'all, everybody. <laughs> but I think with Mark's story, and this is what Stephanie and I talk about a lot, is Thanks like for sharing, Mark. in yeah, order sure. to have these conversations, because uh, some of the conversations, and, and Mark leads that open minds converse. Is it open minds? Open, open conversations. conversations. ERG. Open conversations. ERG. And some of those conversations have been the most impactful conversations I've had in my career at Commerce Tools because people just put their guards down and they say, hey, I might say this incorrectly. I might mess something up. Call me on it. Like, But you know that I'm good intention. And I think something Stephanie and I talk about a lot is the importance of having psychological safety in the organization yeah. to be able to say, hey, I might not be educated in this area. It's something I'm working on, but I want you to call me on it. Right. Like if I say something incorrect or I, if I say something that is offensive, know that I'm coming from a good place and I don't mean it in that way. Right. And you have the freedom to help me yeah. continue on that journey, whoever that is. But it starts with psych psychological safety. Yeah. We say that a lot. Well, it's how you deliver feedback too, because yeah. I've not been great at this and I'll I'll be the first to tell you, giving feedback is hard for me because I always feel like I'm hurting someone's feelings or I'm like saying it, it yeah. wrong yeah. Yeah. or I'm going to cause them to quit or feel bad about themselves. And they probably think, God, he's 
you know, maybe he's just not good at it. I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the tools growing up, but it's trying to put yourself in everyone's situation all the time. And if you can give the feedback in a way that is helpful and and not a feeling of uh, fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always used to say it starts with trying to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. For the moment, just assume that they're not ill-intended, mm-hmm. right? We all mess up. We all say things stupid. We all put our foot in our mouths. But if you can just for a moment, just say they're not ill-intended and just, just try and come see, come see it, meet them halfway and kind of say, what did you really mean by that? Listen, some people are just jerks and they just are. And some people are ill-intended. Wait, but for the me, vast majority- a jerk right now? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to assume, assume, give me the benefit of the doubt here. But I'm saying that I think if we can just see that and that's, that's empathy, right? It's trying to understand somebody oh, on their terms. Yeah. Um, then we're all better for it. And in, in a corporate environment, in a place like Commerce Tools, as we talk about career paths and career trajectory and growing people's, uh, you know, building people's skills and building their career and really trying to bring the best out of everybody, you have to build that relationship and trust with them. Yeah. And from a career perspective, right? If you don't want to share your life story with me, that's fine. But from a career perspective, we need to build that trust that I'm looking out for your best interests, mm-hmm. that you're giving me your best effort. And once we meet in the middle, then if we put our foot in our mouths, we say something stupid, for the most part, people are going to be like, yeah, I know you better than that, right? I know that that's not who you are. So yeah. we're going to be forgiving of each other if we mess up. And, and own up to it. And open to it. Up and to and it. you're not going to improve unless you mess up. Like yeah. very few yeah. people. Why are you saying own up to own it? Own up to <clears> it. Yeah. Like if you mess like up, take accountability for it. Yeah. If you say, hey, guys, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. I needed to say, hey, everyone, just own up to it. People can accept that better than you continuing the cycle of saying the in- incorrect thing. We don't all recognize our faults in the moment. Right. Truth. Right. Yeah. I think if we give ourselves the grace to say, I've come back to you and I realize I made a mistake later. Grace. That's a great word. Yeah, mm-hmm. It comes along with empathy. Yes, it does. So <laughs> we're going circular here today. But I think, no, I talk, I'm thinking about my kids right now. I do yeah. this all the time. I'll mess up and I might say something out of anger or, yep. or just not thinking about it. And then I'll come back 15, 20 minutes later and be like, I'm sorry. Apologizing. I'm getting sorry. For, if you don't have kids, if I'm listening to this podcast, you don't have kids, you're like, why do they talk about this? But if you just come back and you just say, I'm it's sorry, relevant. and that you, the people can see that you're fallible. And this, I guess, is for kids, but it's also for peers. It's mm-hmm. also for direct reports. Right. If people can see that you're. it's okay for you to make a mistake and you own up to that, then they're much more open to making their own mistakes because you don't have to be perfect in life or in your job. You just have to do the best you can. And establishing a culture of feedback too. Like I've been working with my team on that of like, gosh, I said this thing in a meeting and I don't know how it came across. Tell me how you thought that it came across and what do you think that I could do better? I think that really sets a nice stage of yeah. having reciprocal feedback. You have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable Yeah, of asking those questions like, okay, I need you to give me feedback, but I don't know what kind of feedback I'm going to get. But you have to be uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And you have to accept and have a space where you can be uncomfortable. You can say those hard things to people uh, in a very professional way. Of course, we can't just dog people out and call them out, but we can bring up things to I'm sorry, can I go back for a second? You said dog people out? Dog people out. Maybe that's a Southern is that thing? a southern? Thing? I don't know. <laughs> I knew what you meant. I know what you meant too. I, I just, I just trying to have a little fun with it. We gotta spice it up every now and then. Sorry, but be comfortable with being uncomfortable with giving feedback to people, and I think that's what's great about Commerce yeah. Tools. Is we've created a space, we created a psychological safety space for people to share their thoughts and ideas. I'm actually excited. We're starting a new program this year called Radical Candor. We just did that. How We're it doing go? it. It's Give amazing. Us tips. Uh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> You know, our, our CEO of our holding company, Patrick Lindsay at LCI, and we get together and we talk about uncomfortable things and radical candor mm-hmm. was one uh, we just went through and John and I have deployed it through the company and it's, yeah. you have to be on board with it because it can be hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to, especially in a small business too, to, to hear the feedback, you know, we're, we're running fast. You know, we've got a small team, we've got a huge mission, and we've got a lot to to give back and prove. We all have to break through the glass, right, as an organization. And you have to say things that are hard sometimes. And I don't like hearing them. I mean, I don't. I like feedback now. But when I feel as if you're doing a good job and then you're feeling like you're affecting somebody's life, maybe not the way it should be, it's hard to hear it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you implement the candor aspect of it and understanding that the whole organization is, is on board with this philosophy – then it works because then all of a sudden you're having those uncomfortable conversations or you're not holding back as much. And as long as it's professional, yeah. and again, it goes back to intention. If my intentions are good yeah. to make sure, you know, if they're bad, you can, I think you can tell, I, I don't know. I feel like I can tell pretty quickly if someone's intentions are good or bad. I think we have to start thinking about intention and, and what is the intention of what's being said instead yeah. of the quick reaction of I'm going to attack 
uh, versus, hey, let me, you said, I think I must take a step back yeah. and think about your intention first. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the accessibility side. Yeah. Because we started doing some things. I want to know a little bit about some of the, the training aspects, some of the challenges that you're dealing with, and then what, so an intentionality in terms of making sure that all products, the website product moving forward, have that piece. Because Inclusion goes directly connected with access. So first of all, I don't want to speak for the entire product team. Okay, um, just for so, you then. So, uh, <laughs> and, and I have not been part of the product for two years. I'm in the strategy side. But I will say this. Um, I think that it does part have to be part of your everyday. I think that if you're approaching accessibility and you're approaching access to your products from a perspective of it's an ancillary or secondary part of your design, then you're doing a disservice. And ultimately, you're going to fail because it's, if we all know this with software, it costs a lot to change something than to just do it right the first time. Amen. So if that. you're bringing in the idea of this needs to be accessible, our products need to be accessible from the beginning, then it's so much easier. It has to be part of your everyday thought. It has to be part of your design process. It has to be part of your test process. So have you changed that there to include that as a best practice? So or in some ways, process? yes. In some ways, no. And, and I think, like I said, it's a journey and it's something that we're working on. I will say again, going back to Commerce Tools core product, our core product is a set of APIs. Mm -hmm. So there is no visual element that needs to be directly accessible from the perspective, from the of, a, perspective. Of, a, yep. of a user interface, right? Um, our configuration of those, we do have a product that is called the Merchant Center that allows people to configure the product from a visual interface, mm -hmm. but everything that is done there can also be done through APIs. So where there might be failures if, from, from an accessibility side, perspective in that domain, there's a secondary channel that is fully accessible because APIs are by definition fully accessible. They're programmatic. Mm -hmm. And we do have all of our documentation is consumable and in, 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 in RAML, which is an accessibility format. So I think so, th there are definitely ways that we can improve, but there are definitely ways that we are directly accessible to those people who have visual impairments, certainly, or, or mm -hmm. need secondary channels, a way of consuming information. I do know that it has been part of the thought process moving forward to try and make accessibility more of the everyday, you know, as we go through design and we go through committing changes to our visual elements of our product. I've seen this time and time again over for many big companies that were accessibility focused, even if you're not thinking about it at the time of development, then you're going to make mistakes and fixing it is not necessarily easy. Now, the cool thing is, is like when we have our corporate website where we brought Abler in and we did the assessment and we went through the process, you know, there are certainly ways that we can improve that and bring in external mm -hmm. resources to help with that if you don't have the internal knowledge. But I, I think it is it is a constant effort and a constant evaluation that you have to go through from both your development side, but also from your quality assurance side, because if you're not trying to, if you're not testing it, then you're not going to see it either. So uh, I think there's a lot of, there's still improvement to be made. I think we're trying to get there. I am confident that those people, our customers who want to use our product have, have a channel to leveraging it through an accessible means. I would like all channels to be accessible. Yeah. And talk to me real quick about that. So when you deploy to a client, how does that work? Because they have their existing platform, their existing content, right? They're just, yeah. so a lot of times we'll talk with organizations about websites and we do it for we do learning management systems, gamification, uh, mobile apps, billboards, yeah. TV commercial. We do accessibility for every possible thing you could think of. But a lot of times organizations will have this great, will work on their site, but they have these third-party plugins. And it's like, we can only do so much because then when they leave, they go to a third party that's not accessible. And that's a challenge that's happening because a lot of these organizations, and it's Sam's behind the scenes that you don't have that challenge because your organizations are using you and you're accessible in that way. Yeah. That's a huge deal because a lot of times you leave a site and then you're stuck on an inaccessible experience that's a third party operated. Yeah. And I think it's important to understand that what Commerce Tools is, is a platform that enables shopping experiences, right? We're an industry leader in, in what we call composability. And again, it's, API access is, is the forefront of that. And so when we talk about accessibility, almost always we're talking about the front end, which mm -hmm. is the user interface, which That's is right. the, what the things that customers are directly interacting Engaging with. with. Yep. The cool thing about Commerce Tools is, is you have one singular back end to support all of those channels simultaneously. So whatever experience you're developing, you're getting the data the same way consistently. You're getting the information the same way consistently through the same set of, of common APIs that support all the channels all at once. Now, that doesn't necessarily make the front end experience accessible. Mm -hmm. It makes all of the information accessible. And that's a great step towards accessibility. But really, you're talking about who's developing the app. And I want you to, in layman's terms, I do want you to talk about composable 
commerce because yeah like, so could, could you do that real quick and explain that in a, to, to explain Lena? it like you can tell it to your grandma Excel to grandma. explain it like i only <laughs> guess like, explain it like i'm five right so it's philadelphia remember the movie philadelphia with denzel washington and tom hanks and he says explain to me like i'm a four-year-old explain yeah. like a four-year-old yeah, yeah like a five there you go. no i mean compulsible commerce is is just the idea that you get to pick what you need to build the thing you want and that's the general concept behind a cold commerce. You want to build great commerce experiences. So I'm a brand or a major retailer, and I want to build experiences that are consistent across all of my channels. Again, our, our app, our website, sure, yeah. or whatever our channel might be. Social commerce now coming down the pike. And I want to build a great experiences that are common across all of those. Well, and I want to do it in the way that fits me best, because I don't want you to prescribe to me what is best for me or my customers. I want to have the flexibility to do it any way I want. Well, that's what composable commerce from a methodology gives you. So you're like Burger King. Basically. You pick the piece. That you have it your, your way. way. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to sing the jingle. Though. They'll, they'll, so they'll strike I, this from the record. <laughs> but the idea that you pick the pieces that are best fit for what you want to build. That's the idea of composability. Now, Commerce Tools is the industry leader in composable platform from a commerce perspective. And so we like to think that we, uh, we help kind of move this forward propel this movement forward. Uh, a lot of this is done through a technological perspective. I don't want to get too deep into it. Something called headless, which again means that you're not prescribing a front end experience. It's all API driven. So mm -hmm. again, you can access the same information from anywhere, from any channel that you want. We're not prescribing to you what something needs to look or feel like. So we enable these great front end brand experiences by having a consistent and scalable and accessible backend. Wow, well said. Did I do it like I'm five? Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, was it? Yeah, the first part was like five. Then you went to like teenager. Man. Sorry, I kind of. And then I you kind of went into like I kind of leap forward to like IT guy from his thirties, and I'm lost. <laughs> but I'm interested just just for a moment about our engagement because we talked a year or so ago. I think immediately we had just a fun relationship, a fun conversation, yeah. and we got to meet the rest of the crew. Is there anything like what have you guys learned just in a short period of time with our time together with Abler? Like I said before, you all have opened up our eyes to see what we have not tapped into, um, given us the opportunity to to look at things different and see it in the eyes of someone else who has a disability or uses screen readers or external keyboards. One of your participants, I can't remember his name, he reviewed our website. Angus, probably. Probably so. Yeah. And um, just by him going through it and talking through it, it made me feel comfortable, first of all, because I'm not a techie person, but he was able to explain it. And I was like, oh, this is what it's like for someone who has a visual impairment that they can't see because of the color or the font that we use or whatever the alt tags that we use. They can't uh, maneuver. So there's breaks in our site where they couldn't see it. And it really opened up my eyes of what it feels like to be someone who has a, a disability in that aspect. So it just really opened up things for me to start talking to the organization differently and bring in awareness and try to instill some policy changes. We have a accessibility statement now. We have things where we can uh, talk to the employees about what their needs are. It's really just constantly evolving and I'm so excited to continue to learn more and to expand more within the organization. Awesome. What, what I liked is when we first had the conversation with you from the Abler perspective is you met us where we were. Yeah. You didn't try and push us too far too fast. You kind of said, well, what can we do for you? How can we support you in your learnings? Um, and the, yeah, the experience of, of having your, your team go ahead and do an accessibility assessment on our site, give us the information in yeah. a very clearly concise, well understood format. We were easy, took that exact information, we were able to give it to our website developers. They were super excited to get the feedback because they wanted to improve the yeah. website. Yeah. And, you know, we get a little bit of advertisement here. There was no judgment. Right. There wasn't like, oh, you all are missing X, Y, Z. How could you? Right. <laughs> it was very much of a, it was very much of a, we're going to help you. Yeah improve in, as best as you can. And we talked about it being a journey and everybody mm -hmm. you know, having different funding or different potential to do mm -hmm. it. You take small steps when you can, where yeah. you can, and you move the needle forward as best you can. And every little step is going to help. It's not going to improve everything tomorrow, mm -hmm. but every little step you take forward is, is a help. And I think that a company like yours, like Abler, that enables that in a non-judgmental way is super important. Yeah. I appreciate you saying the non-judgmental. Um, yeah, we try, we try not to lead with anything other than support and help because it's not an easy journey to do any of this. And anyone, especially and I, and I, especially commerce tools and all of our other clients that are doing it, 
any little bit of help matters and, and the relationship matters. Yeah. And how yeah. we how we work together and how we grow together. That's yeah. great. I, and I think the way I look at this whole journey that we're all on is, is, is together is, you know, it's starting with accessibility. Uh, accessibility is the first place to go because you're trying to make sure your co consumers are able to access your content. Then you start looking inward a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we make sure that our internet is right or our human resources policies are right and all that. And then, then all of a sudden you start looking at, well, what about our communication? How do we make sure we're inclusive? And how do we start training people? This is what we need to talk about as well at our disability inclusion training, mm -hmm. uh, which you will love. It's created by people that, with disabilities. It's yeah, 30 exactly. hours of footage. It's really cool. It's kind of like a setting like this where people, we talk and ask really pointed questions about preferences mm -hmm. and etiquette and inclusive language. It's really well done. Now it's shifting into inclusion. So you got access inclusion, and then it's going to start shifting into staffing and untapped talent mm -hmm. and people that have been on the, the sidelines. It's an evolution. And, and the beauty of it is we're all going to be here to watch it. And yeah. we're going to be here to see it. Yeah. But what you all are doing and, and why I'm so grateful for you being here, because you're doing it in every division of your organization and you're doing it from the top down and the bottom up. And it's really been an honor to work with you guys. And I mean that sincerely. I'm so grateful that you guys came here. I have no <laughs> idea what's going to happen with this, but I'm so grateful that you came. I think the conversation was excellent. Um, hard things to say, but great things to say. And I'm I'm severely honored that you're here. I think you guys are doing amazing work. I'm blown away. Wow. Severely blown away. Thanks for joining us on part two of this episode of Access Granite, the podcast powered by Abler. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in and engaging with us on this important topic of accessibility and inclusion. A special shout out to our incredible clients, like Commerce Tools, who are leading the charge in prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion on a global scale. They have truly exemplified what it means to champion accessibility in their respective roles, and their dedication should inspire us all. Stay tuned for more insightful conversations and let's continue to work together towards a more inclusive world.